Hi guys, and welcome back to another demo with Man and Machine. I'm Francisco Perez-Smith, mechanical engineer and FEA enthusiast. Today, we're going to continue our series on NASTRAN INCAD, starting with our first demo, setting up a linear static analysis. As this is our first demo, we're also going to be having a good look at NASTRAN's user interface, as many of the controls tend to be pretty common between the different analysis types. So before we begin, we'll have a quick look at what's involved in linear static analysis. Linear static is probably the most common type of analysis and is used to see how the design behaves under static loading. It can return all kinds of useful information including linear stress, strain and deflection. It's quick and easy to set up and oftentimes very quick to compute. For these reasons, it's the default analysis type in NASTRAN. But all of these conveniences come at a price. Linear static analysis must adhere to some pretty draconian set of assumptions and limitations. By its nature, the analysis is linear only, as opposed to nonlinear. This means that the materials must behave linearly and elastically. In metals, this limits the allowable stresses to below yield strength. Furthermore, deflections and rotations must be small relative to the overall size of the geometry. Boundary conditions must also be constant and cannot depend on load application. If any of these conditions cannot be met, then a nonlinear analysis should be used. The other assumption is that the analysis is static as opposed to dynamic. This simply means that the load is applied slowly and consistently and does not change in any special way. It also means that the inertia of the material is not taken into account. Things like a drop test, for example, make no sense without inertia. If these conditions cannot be met, then it's better to use a dynamic analysis. Okay, enough of the theory, let's get to it. Okay, for our first analysis, we're going to have a look at a simple cantilever design. This simple prism is going to be fixed at this end, and we're going to apply a load facing downwards at this end. Now, because Nastran is embedded into Inventor, the material properties that we assign in the CAD environment actually get brought over to Nastran. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to change this from generic over to mild steel. There it is. Now, to get into NASTRAN, all we need to do is go into the Environments tab and click Autodesk NASTRAN in CAD. Autodesk have done a really, really good job of organizing NASTRAN into their environments. Like all their other environments, it works very much from left to right. I'd like to draw your attention over to this left area, though. As you can see, we've got two subtrees, one called Analysis 1 with Linear Static set as its default, and another called Model. I'm going to expand them both out. Underneath Analysis 1, we can see nodes, elements, parts, idealizations. We can already see that a solid 1 has been assigned to our cantilever, and that the material property of being steel, mild, has been brought over as well. There's a little exclamation mark next to the mesh model, because a mesh hasn't yet been generated. Underneath this, we can see subcases with subcase 1 and its corresponding loads and constraints. However, if we look underneath at the model tree, we can see that there's also a materials holder here with our mild steel. This is because we are able to add in a whole bunch of materials into the model and then bring them individually into different analyses types. We may be interested in how this uh, cantilever behaves if it's made of aluminium or if it's made out of PLA. We can also see things like loads and constraints. This is because it's possible to designate constraints and then bring them into different subcases or remove them from certain subcases and bring them back later. We'll have a look very shortly at that. Firstly, what we're going to do is we're going to place our first constraint. We're going to select the fixed end. And here, for clarity, we're going to give a name to the constraint. We're going to call it constraint one, fixed end. We can see what type of constraint we're adding here. By default, it's set to structural, but we also have options for thermal or response spectrum. If you have a look to the right, there are six little tick boxes, each representing the degrees of freedom that get locked down by this constraint. So TX, TY, and TZ mean translation in X, translation in Y, and translation in Z, and RX, RY, RZ mean rotation in X, rotation about Y, and rotation about Z. Now, by default, it's fixed in all six degrees of freedom. If we wanted to, however, change it to a pinned joint, we could click here, and it would remove the rotation about x, y, and z, and keep the translation around x, y, and z. 
If we were to change it to a no rotation constraint, then it would prohibit rotation around x, y, and z and alleviate t, x, t, y, z, z. What we want to do is fix all six degrees of freedom. So we're going to go ahead and click fixed or tick each of the boxes. Now, if we zoom in and we click these little goggles, what we get is a view of the glyph that is meant to represent the constraint that we've placed down. Now, it might look a little jumbled to begin with, but it actually makes a lot of sense. One cone means translation and two cones means rotation. So see what happens if I untick translation around Y. You can see that that single cone goes missing. If I untick rotation around Y, the double cone goes missing. This applies to all the directions, but it's a way that you can quickly and visually see what that constraint is. We can also change the density by moving this slider, increasing the number of these glyphs that we are using to represent that uh, constraint on that face. I like to achieve it at just one. You can also change its size if you need the glyph to be more visible at the model level. We'll just keep it small for now. Once we're done, we'll click OK. We can see that this has created a constraint under subcase one, fixing this face in space. You can also see, however, that it's created a constraint underneath the model tree. Basically, we've added to our library of elements that we're going to be using in our FEA that constraint. If I were to come along and I were to delete constraint one from subcase one by saying right click remove, I could bring it back if I wanted to by simply clicking and dragging it from the model. And there we've restored it. So what we're going to do next is we're going to place a load on the other end of the beam. So we'll rotate our view and we'll go up to the top and we'll click load. As before, what we're going to do is select the face that we want to apply the load to and we're going to give it a name. Load 1 loading, just for clarity. Here we get to choose what kind of uh, force, what kind of load we're, we're placing on this. So by default, force is uh, selected, but you can also place a moment, a distributed load, gravity, remote force, bearing load, um, all of these, including temperature and things like that. We're going to leave it as force for now. Now, as you can see, how do we define the direction of that force? By default, it goes from the, uh, from the universal coordinate system of the component itself. So as you can see, there's x, there's y, there's z. What we want to do is put a force downwards of 4,500 newtons. So we'll go to force y and say, type in negative 4,500 newtons. As before, we can also click the goggles here, and we can see the glyph that represents the force. As before, we can increase the density, and we can increase the size, but we'll leave those unchanged for now. By clicking OK, we've created our loading on that face. Just like the constraint, we can see the load placed underneath subcase one, loading one. We can also see the load written to the model library here as load one, loading. If we were to come along to the subcase and delete it, we could restore it by bringing it back from the loads in the library. So there we go. We're almost ready to go. In order to run the finite element analysis, we need to actually create a mesh. That is, we need to replace this geometry <clears throat> with a whole bunch of little elements that will be approximating its, um, its uh, geometry. So we'll go ahead and click Mesh Settings up here. And here's where you would play around with the, uh, with the parameters of the mesh. Here you can play with element size and tolerance and the kind of elements that you do. But for now, we're just going to click Generate Mesh. And click OK. As you can see, it's overlaid a mesh over our geometry. And we've approximated our geometry using these uh, finite elements. Now I think we're ready to run. So we'll go over to the top and we'll click Run. As you can see, the solver is churning away on the side. And we can see NASTRAN solution complete. However, if we go along the bottom, we can see total warnings equal one. Warnings may be something insignificant or it may be something significant. So before we go into looking at the results, I think it's worth looking at. So we'll click OK. And we'll drag this out a little bit and go to our Autodesk NASTRAN output. And here we can see the output of the solver. At the bottom, we've got our feedback, total warnings equal one, fatal errors equal zero. So we're going to go up and we're going to see if we can find our warning. It should be in red text. There it is. 
Warning T2061, unreasonable uh, material data. So it's not very uh, reasonable to memorize all of the error codes. So Autodesk have included a neat function. You can actually click on the uh, error code and it will actually take you to the Autodesk website where it will show you what that error code translates to. In this case, T2061 translates to this. Um, bulk data entry combined an invalid modulus of elasticity, shear modulus, or Poisson's ratio. What this means is that we've got a redundancy of material properties. If we go back to our model tree and we look at the material mild steel, we can edit it. And here we've got the material properties. We've got our common material properties like its tensile limit and its uh, yield limit, uh, mass density. If we look down at the structural um, properties, we can see elastic modulus and shear modulus and Poisson's ratio. However, Poisson's ratio is ordinarily calculated by uh, the elastic modulus and the shear modulus. So what we have here is a redundancy. So all we need to do, we don't have to, but what we're going to do is select Poisson's ratio and delete it and click OK and see if that got rid of our redundancy. We're going to go ahead and we're going to run it again. And this time, oh, beautiful, all blue. So it says, Nastran solution complete, total warnings equals zero, total fatal errors equals zero. We're going to go ahead and click OK. Now we're ready to have a look at some results. So to look at the results, we're going to go up here and we're going to click Contour. What this does is it overlays colors on our model so we can see the different metrics, as, uh, metrics that we're interested in. By default, it selected solid von Mises stress in megapascals. From the legend, we can see that the maximum von Mises stress experience is 214 megapascals, and the minimum is 2.8 megapascals. Sorry, that's von Mises, isn't it? The minimum von Mises stress is 2.8 megapascals. Now, if we wanted to have a look at other things, we could have a look at displacement. And here we can see the maximum displacement experienced under the load is 1.6 millimeters. Now, in order to see what that looks like, we can go ahead here and click Animate. This gives us an exaggerated visual representation of what it would look like under loading. However, as you can tell from the animation, this is a lot more than 1.6 millimeters. It, uh, it actually exaggerates the amount of displacement so that you can very clearly see the kind of... Uh, uh, motion that you're getting. So in order to have a look at what it would really look like, we're going to go to Options, and we're going to go to Deform Options, click Actual, and this will make uh, this will make the uh, animation show the actual result. So we'll go ahead and now we'll click Animate, and this is what the beam actually looks like under load, if you needed a more realistic representation. So we're going to go ahead and click Cancel now. And we're going to have a look at one more type. If we go down to Other, we can see the metric of Safety Factor. So I'm going to change it to Other and change it to Safety Factor. And here we can see the minimum and maximum Safety Factor allocated. By default, it's a Safety Factor relative to Yield we can see that the minimum experienced is 1.2. So none of the material actually experiences yield stress. This would be completely elastic under the load that we've designated to it. So that concludes analysis one. Okay, for our second analysis, we're gonna look at a slightly more complicated geometry. <clears throat> we have this lifting eye here, and we want to know if it can handle a 90,000 Newton load. So what we're gonna do is, as we did before, we're gonna assign a material. We'll change it from generic, to uh, stainless steel 440. Next, we'll go over to the Environments tab, Autodesk Nastran NCAD. As before, we'll place a constraint, and we'll say we'll, we're gonna prohibit translation X, Y, and Z, rotation X, Y, and Z around the thread. So basically, we're fixing the thread in place completely. Next, what we wanna do is place a load that acts on this bearing here. However, we can't just put a simple force. If we were to place a force, what would happen is we would have a force that would be evenly distributed along the skin of this eye, uh, above it and below it. What we actually need to select is a bearing load here. So we'll click bearing load and we'll select that face. Now, 
If you're very observant, you'd notice that the uh, universal coordinate system of this component is upside down. It was modeled upside down. Y, positive y in this direction is actually facing down. So in order to get a, a 90,000 newton um, load going downwards, we need to place a positive value of 90,000 newtons in the force y direction. And here we can click the preview to see what it looks like. Oh, that's lovely. OK, so we'll go ahead and click OK. And what we need to do next is create a mesh. As before, we're not going to play around with it too much this time. And there we've got a mesh representation of our model. In anticipation of that redundant Poisson's ratio issue that we encountered earlier, what we're going to do is we're going to edit the material, stainless steel 440. And here we've got elastic modulus, shear modulus, and Poisson's ratio. We're just going to remove Poisson's ratio. And go ahead and click OK. Now we're free to go ahead and click Run. Oh, it's all blue. Excellent, excellent. Wonderful. Solution complete. Zero warnings, zero fatal errors. We're going to go ahead and click OK. Now we can go ahead and click Contour. And here we can see the von Mises stress as it's distributed throughout our, our design. We can see that the peak stress experience is 157 megapascals. Now, if you remember your material properties, the stainless steel should be able to handle this just fine. But just in case you didn't remember, we can change it from stress down to other, and we can have a look at the safety factor. Here we can see the minimum safety factor is 7.87, and that's experienced on the inside of that thread there. Basically, this design would be perfectly fine to hold 90,000 newtons. Okay guys, that does it for our introduction to linear static analysis in NAS training CAD. As always, like and subscribe if you'd like to learn more, and be sure to tune in for the rest of our series on FEA. Thanks for watching and happy engineering!